I'm not sure how you see things, but I've come to realize that there are at least two different kinds of people in this world today. And let me know if you agree with this or not. Uh, the first would be this. There are people like this uh, that when you get in their car or in their car, they tend to run on full, right? I, uh, this, this would be my dad, for example. My, my dad sees no reason why the fuel gauge should ever drop below about halfway. There are plenty of gas stations. There's no reason not to keep the car filled up. How many of you live your life like this, right? You, you run on full. I'm, I'm, a, I'm more like this than I think you know where this is going because there are these people and then there are these people, right? There are these people that love living their life this way. There are these people that when you get into their car, this is what it looks like. How many of you live like this? How many of you run like this? We got a lot of rebels here at Genesis Church. I mean, look around. You can see them right now. How many of you live with somebody like this or drive or share their car and it drives you crazy, right? You know, that they live this way. But for those of you that live this way, you treat the fuel indicator light like a game. It's like a competition. And so every time that light comes on, it's one more mile. How many more miles can I get out of this? There are, right? There are two different kinds of people. There are those that live on full and there are those that are running empty. Interestingly, this little illustration applies to something else about life. And honestly, I think this is true of more of us than it should. And I realize that this question might be a little unfair. You know, we're coming uh, to the end of the weekend. Uh, you know, we're, we're through the holidays. We've started a new year. If you've got kids, all of those programs are resuming. But for how many of you, when you look at a picture like this, like how many of you does this illustrate how you feel about your energy level most days? You know, your, your, your outlook on life or, you know, maybe as you even begin to think about tomorrow and some of the responsibilities you have tomorrow or maybe the upcoming week, or I'll just ask it like this. How many of you, how many of you feel like you're running on empty right now? I do, and uh, I, I do probably more than I should. And uh, Jenny and I, we just finished a really you know, busy fall and winter and lots of cross-country meets with our kids and, and then, you know, all of the holidays and there was December and finishing up the year and all the extra things with, with church. And so we got some vacation time in the sun the first week of January and we didn't do much of anything. But by day three, I crashed. I mean, I was exhausted. I mean, you know that feeling like when you've been going and going and you finally start coming down and it's just always over you because we're always so busy. I'm always in a hurry, always on the go. And my guess is I'm not alone in that. I think we all experience that because when it comes to busyness and hurry, like we're great at this as Americans. I mean, you wanna talk about the things that we've got figured out. We've got this going all day long. Like we love it. We, we accept it as a norm, especially here, you know, on the north side of Indianapolis. Like we treat our pace and our busyness like a trophy or an accomplishment or something. And because of it, we never slow down. And, and too many of us are overextended. We're running on fumes and our busyness, when you think about it, it's like this drain that just depletes anything we have left to give. And it's not good good for you and it's not good for me and it's not good for your kids and for the people in your life and it's it's not good for your faith it's not good for my relationship with the lord Michael Zigarelli is a college professor, was a part of a, a study, a survey of over 20,000 Christians across the globe. And he concluded these things when it comes to hurry and, and how uh, it, it impacts our faith. He says that first Christians are no different than anyone else when it comes to hurry and busyness in this world. There's really no distinction. Secondly, God is as a result becoming even more marginalized in our lives. Third, this leads to a weakened relationship with God. And here's where it gets frightening too, which leads to Christianity. Christians becoming even more vulnerable and accepting of secular beliefs in our culture today. Bottom line is this, our busyness messes with everything. Uh, our relationships, our health, the way we think about things, and most importantly, our relationship with God, which makes this next statement by writer and pastor John Ortberg all the more terrifying because he said this about hurry and about faith. He says, for many of us, the great danger is not that we will renounce our faith. It's that we will become so distracted and rushed and preoccupied that we will settle for a mediocre version of it. And hang on that. I read that recently. And I couldn't help but think this. So many young people around us 
are, are ditching their faith today and for all sorts of different reasons. But, here, but here's what I got to thinking. As a parent, I just wonder if we need to ask ourselves, do the, does the pace at which we force and allow our kids to live, are we doing more harm to their faith than we realize? But how do you slow down, right? Because there's always one more activity, there's one more lesson, there's one more night out, there's one more travel team and tournament, and so we don't stop. And when we do get tired, so often we will take a big step back. Like we'll take a big step back from our church family, we'll take a big step back and say, well, you know, my kids don't have time to be a part of something like GSM, or we take a big step back from even just home, being home together with, with, our, with, with the people that we love. And so this weekly grind, like it's not good for any of us, especially when it comes to our relationship with the Lord. But what if I told you this? What if I told you that there was a better way to live? Really a better weekly rhythm. And get this, it's from God. It was created by him and he created it for us. And I know this too. I I believe this. I, I think all of us, no matter who you are, no matter how long you've been around church or this church or whatever it may be, like, I think we all get tired of the rush. We've all got that in common and we'd love to find a way out. And we just don't know how, but maybe this could help. And so today we're wrapping up a series we've been in here at Genesis all month long, the beginning of this year, a series called Strong Start. And so for the last few weeks, we've been talking about these helpful practices and habits that if we applied them could help us grow in our relationship with Jesus. And last week, Michael talked about the importance of of God's word and and meditating on it. Today, I wanna talk with you about Sabbath rest, which may be familiar to some of you. Some of you may be practicing this. If you've applied this to your life, for others of you, this could be very foreign and very brand new, but Sabbath rest is a way of ordering your life around a regular weekly pattern. And it just simply goes like this, that six days a week, you do all of the work. And one day a week is different. It's distinct. And it's a day when you rest. And with that day of rest, a chance to break from the routine, a chance to experience something new and life-giving in this world so that we might better understand who we are, who God is, and how life was intended to be lived today. And so turn in your Bibles, if you have them with you today, to Exodus chapter 20, all right, the second book of the Old Testament, right at the beginning of your Bible, Exodus chapter 20. We'll also have these words on the screen. Just a little heads up, we're going to start a study in the book of Exodus beginning next week that's going to take us through the winter and into the spring. But Exodus 20 today, let me just kind of set the stage for you. Uh, Many of you know uh, parts of this, but God brought his people out of slavery in Egypt and led them to a place in the wilderness called Sinai. And as I heard someone once say, Sinai is the place where God married his people. One of the verses that'll be real important to us in our series comes out of Exodus chapter six, when God said, I will be your God and you will be my people. And so if Sinai is where the wedding happened, Torah or law was like God's wedding gift to his bride. And with it, God was ready to instruct his people how to live right and faithfully here on this earth. And within Torah, you'll also find what we know as the 10 commandments. And it's fair to say that the Ten Commandments provide a pretty good summary of all of the laws uh, encompassed in, in the book or in, in Torah. But here's what's interesting, amongst many things. Here's what's interesting about the Ten Commandments: the first three describe how we relate to God; the last six describe how we relate to one another. The fourth commandment is really unique; it's unlike the others, and it sits curiously in the middle of two categories. Let me read it for you: Exodus chapter 20, beginning in verse eight. We read, "Remember the Sabbath day by keeping." it holy. Six days you shall labor and do all your work, but the seventh day is a Sabbath to the Lord your God. On it you shall not do any work, neither you, your son or daughter, nor your male or female servant, nor your animals, nor any foreigner residing in your towns. Emphasis here on the word remember. The first word in the text. It's God's way of saying that there's something special about Sabbath rest, something life-giving and essential for us. But the fact is that we tend to look at Sabbath rest as something of the past, don't we? It's uh, maybe something that your grandparents talked about. It's it's old-fashioned. It's optional. It's something for weirdos. Like, I mean, if you're some kind of strange family or whatever. But the fact is that, that, that God has something special for each of us. In fact, we could say it like this, that Sabbath rest is a gift. 
It's just simply a gift. It's a chance to take one day a week as a day different than the others, a day of rest, a gift from God. And how do we better understand the intent of Sabbath? Well, we've had a friend of mine, a Bible teacher here before, a guy by the name of Brad Gray. And he talks about, I always remember this, he talks about a helpful Bible study method known as the principle of first use. That basically when you come across a word like Sabbath in the Bible, it can be helpful to ask, where was this word first used in scripture? That first use tends to help provide better clarity. Now, does anyone know where the word Sabbath is first used in scripture? Well, if you're like me and you're thinking the creation account, because that's what I thought, God resting on the seventh day, yeah, there is an example there that we're going to see just in 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 a moment, but actually the first use of the word Sabbath is found just a few pages away in Exodus chapter 16. And just to give you some context again, before arriving at Sinai, the people were on their way through the wilderness, they were getting hungry, they were searching for food, and Exodus 16 shows us how God is going to provide for them. Uh, God provided quail in the evening. He helped provide their meat. He provided a bread-like substance called manna in the morning. He instructed the people to gather only as much as they needed for each day. Don't grow, to take too little. Don't, don't take too much. No more, no less. And then there were some struggles in this, like many things. Some people gathered too much only to find it spoiled by the next day. But eventually the people started learning their lesson. Let's pick it up in verse 20. We read, each morning everyone gathered as much as they needed, and when the sun grew hot, it melted away. On the sixth day, they gathered twice as much, two omers for each person, and the leaders of the community came and reported this to Moses. He said to them, this is what the Lord commanded. Tomorrow is to be a day of Sabbath rest, a holy Sabbath to the Lord. So bake what you want to bake and boil what you want to boil, save whatever is left and keep it until morning. So they did, verse 24, they saved it until morning as Moses commanded, and it did not stink or get maggots in it, which that's good. Uh, Verse 25, eat it today, Moses said, because today is a Sabbath to the Lord. You will not find any of it on the ground today. And then here it is, six days you are to gather it, but on the seventh day, the Sabbath, there will not be any. And so there it is the first use of Sabbath, or the Hebrew word Shabbat. And that's a fun word to say, but it's a word that just simply means to stop, to break, or also interestingly, to delight. And so God's people started understanding Sabbath rest as a gift. This is a gift from the Lord. This is a break, a a rhythm, a break from the grind or the work. But I want you also to see how it's a faith issue too. Because put yourself in their shoes. If you're an Israelite living in the desert, I mean, can you just see how your faith would be tested day after day over and over again? And so God is using all of this to strengthen their faith and their dependence on him. He's teaching his people to trust. And in the same way, man, can't you see how practicing Sabbath rest today might require the same level of trust? Because if I'm gonna consider taking one day a week to break from the work, well, then that means that I'm trusting God to provide for all of my needs. It means that I'm trusting God that all of the work around the house or all of the work around the yard is going to get done. It means trusting God that one less tournament or team isn't gonna impact your kid going pro. It's trusting God that one day a week from the homework isn't going to ruin you. Like so much of Sabbath, practicing Sabbath is learning to trust. I'm forced to ask the question, will I trust God? Do I trust his ways? I mean, try it for a while and you'll, you'll, t- you'll, you'll see, I, I've seen this, some of you have seen this, how we, we find value, we find so much value in our busyness and in our hurry. Now back to Exodus 20 for just a second, a couple of things that make the fourth commandment unique. Interestingly, it's the longest uh, when it comes to description, when it comes to the commandments. It's also the only commandment that includes a story and an event. And here's where we see the creation account. Look again, Exodus chapter 20, starting in verse eight. Remember the Sabbath day by keeping it holy. Six days you shall labor and do all your work, but the seventh day is different. It's a Sabbath to the Lord your God. On it you not shall not do any work, neither you nor your son or daughter nor your female, male or female servant, nor your animals or any foreigner residing in your towns. And then verse 11, for in six days the Lord made the heavens and the earth, the sea and all that is in them, but he rested on the seventh day. Therefore, the Lord blessed the Sabbath day and made it holy. And so there's the event, the creation account, 
And if you read through it, if you read through Genesis chapters one and two, maybe do this this afternoon or in the morning, you're gonna see how God created the earth and there's an order to it. There's a cadence, there's a rhythm because for God, he worked and he created for six days, but on the seventh day, he finished his work and he rested. And why did God take a break? Like, did he really get to the end of all of creation? Say, man, I really need a day to myself or, you know, a day away or something. No, with his rest, God provided an example for us to follow. Like the fourth commandment is tied to what he did. He finished his work. He created the Sabbath and then rested and called it a holy day. And here's where this gets really special. What the creator of the universe created and modeled, he's invited you and me to do the same. I mean, he created a rhythm that we can implement into our week, our rest, our work. It's God's way of saying that your life is so much more than what you can accomplish between now and what you accomplish before the grave, but it's hard. I mean, if we get really honest with ourselves, we all know that it's hard, it's hard to slow down. And something else, our culture doesn't permit us to live this way. Uh, Things don't run like this. And you know that especially if you're trying to get through school or if you're working a job and also trying to get through grad school or, or if you're working two jobs just to get by and to provide for your family, like you know what little time you have. Or if you have kids, how, how many of you know this to be true? If you have kids and your kid is involved in just one thing, like you know how much time and commitment that one thing takes. If you're single or if you're a single parent, honestly, I don't know how you do it sometimes. But somehow and in some way, we have to learn this very important lesson that you're not a machine and I'm not either. I mean, we were created in the image of God and we were not created to run on fumes and to push ourselves to the end. We've made life, I've made life so complicated and so hectic. So much of what I've been learning about Sabbath rest and even with what I'm sharing to you with you this morning uh, came out of a great book. We've talked about it before. Some of you have picked it up. Some of you have read it on your own. It's here on the screen. It's a book by a pastor by the name of John Mark Comer uh, entitled The Ruthless Elimination of Hurry. And in this book, Comer addresses this idea of culture and the grind and the pace that we keep and the impact it's having on us. And he references what he calls a little social experiment conducted during the French Revolution going all the way back to 1789. And he explains it like this, that during the revolution, the French abandoned the seven-day work week and instead switched to a 10-day work week in order to up productivity. The result disaster. Amongst other things, the economy crashed, the suicide rate skyrocketed, and productivity, it actually went down. Comer writes this. He says, it's been proven study after study that there's zero correlation between hurry and productivity. In fact, once you work a certain number of hours a week, your productivity actually plummets. Want to know what the magic number is? 50 hours. The irony, that's about a six-day work week. He adds another study found that there was zero difference in productivity between workers who logged 70 hours a week and those who logged 55. He ends with this question, could God be speaking to us through our tired bodies? We can't help but wonder, could he be speaking to you and me through our exhaustion? Because you're not a machine. Your kids aren't either. We weren't created to go 24 seven without stopping. And the good news, the good news is that we don't have to. Like the beautiful truth of the gospel, the beautiful truth of Jesus is that Sabbath rest provides a better way for us. And once again, Sabbath rest means a better weekly rhythm. It's six days a week of work, six days to get it all done. One day that's different, that you set aside to rest And so part of my challenge to you today as we wrap up this series is to consider how you might arrange your week and establish a rhythm that allows you to do just that. And as you'll find, if you choose to study this on your own, like God has a lot to say about Sabbath and how we experience it. And it's no coincidence either that Jesus is gonna come along in the New Testament and have a lot to say about Sabbath and how we experience it as well. And like all things, Jesus is the perfect model. He's the perfect model for how we do all of life, how life should be lived and how Sabbath 
Sabbath, things like Sabbath should be observed. Jesus observed the Sabbath. Uh, it's an important part of his life and story. I mean, every week and, and, and this type of living, not just only on the Sabbath, but it's spilled over to every day of the week and how he lived his life. Like he would spend time with people, Jesus would, but then he would go away regularly to be alone with the Father. He enjoyed meals with people and he would slow down. Like we never see Jesus in a hurry. And so he would observe the Sabbath. And again, he would let this kind of living spill over and impact every day of his week. But this Sabbath type of living wasn't just intended for Jesus to enjoy because it was Jesus who said in Mark chapter two, verse 27, that the Sabbath was made for man, not man for Sabbath. And if you know this story at all, if you know this interaction, there were a whole bunch of religious leaders that were trying to attach a bunch of rules and restrictions to the Sabbath so much that it was becoming a burden for people. But Sabbath was never intended to be a burden. It was intended to be a gift, a gift from God for each of us. And a little side note, it doesn't have to be the same day of the week for everyone because the Apostle Paul in Romans chapter 14 reminds us that there's no one day that is more sacred or holier than any other day. But here's what I want to do, and here's how I want to end, because this is a ton to try and pack into one Sunday. And, and here's what I hope. I hope, if anything, if this is new to you, I hope you get curious about it. And maybe do some reading and some studying on your own or in your small group that maybe you talk about some of these things. I don't want to give you the wrong impression either. I don't have this figured out. I fail at Sabbath miserably all the time. Our family does. But we're doing the work. And hey, it's the start of a new year, right? And so that's always a good time to reevaluate some of the priorities. So here's the question that I want to end with. Like, what does Sabbath rest? Like, what could this look like today? Like, what could this look like for us here in Hamilton County or on the north side today? And again, I'm not going to spend a ton of time on any of these. Uh, that's why I would recommend John Mark Comer's book of, as one. And there's some others that I can recommend to you if you're interested. But practically speaking, if Sabbath rest is an invitation to take one day a week to stop doing the work and to delight in this gift from God, what's that kind of day look like? And what should it involve? And it may look different for each of us, but I will say this, it needs to involve three things. They're on the screen. The first one is just this. It needs to be a day of rest. And so I won't tell you what your Sabbath should look like or what rest looks like for you, but it should involve rest because there is a time to hurry. Don't get me wrong. There is a time to work hard and to push hard, but just like running the RPMs on the engine of your car too high for too long will ruin the engine, our bodies really aren't much different. We need rest. We need it to live well. And so rest means something different for everyone. It means something different for you if you're a kid or a student or if you're single or if you're married. Man, if you're parents of young kids, right, you know this is a challenge. You're gonna have to get creative in figuring out what rest looks like in your home. But the challenge, and again, this takes practice, is to figure it out and to practice rest. And, and I'll tell you, though, what it means every time for every person. Like, your day of rest should mean breaking from whatever is work for you. And whether that's work around the house or work around uh, the office or schoolwork, like, find ways of resting so that you can unplug and get refreshed and renewed and recharged. Here's something else. It's also a day to live. And this, this is where it gets fun, and this is where it might be a real game changer for some of you. Because if you grew up in a legalistic home, or you might hear Sabbath and think restrictions, and no fun, but I don't think that's the intent of Sabbath rest at all. I believe that Sabbath is a day to live. It's a day to know the joy of being alive. John Mark Comer says, we need to learn how to play again, all of us. We need to learn how to play. And when he says play, basically, what are the activities that breathe life into you and breathe life into your family? And so is it a hobby or crafts or games? Is it exercise or sports or competition? Like, Maybe for some of you, it's a ride in your car and a really long one or a ride on your bike or, or, or on your boat. Maybe it's, it's working in your shop or it's out working in the garden. Maybe it's cooking and eating really good food. Ruth Haley Barton has written about topics like these, Sabbath. She says this about Sabbath. Sabbath means a nap, a, a walk, a bike ride. It's wearing your favorite jog pants. It's a long bubble bath if you're into something like that. It's uh, eating your favorite food. Special note there, no dieting, no keto on the Sabbath. Uh, it's sitting in the sun. It's playing a game of pickup football with your kids and neighbors. It's lighting candles. It's time with good friends. As I said, I'm, I'm not your model or example on how to do Sabbath well. 
But again, hey, it's a new year. For Jenny and I, uh, we make every effort to take one day a week and make it distinct from the others, a day to rest. And because Sunday is a work day for me, that means it's gotta be Friday or it's gotta be Saturday. Again, some weeks it's really hard to pull off. And so our Sabbath might only be part of a day. And so we make every effort to break from the work, or I love this, I don't know where Jenny heard this, but she says this a lot. Sabbath rest for us means a day of not have to's, but a day of get to's. All right, think about that. It's not a, it's a day not of have to's, it's a day of get do's. And so what do we get to do? What makes this day different? How do we rest? How do we slow down? How do we spend time with family and friends? Because Jenny normally does a lot of the cooking in our house. She doesn't cook unless she feels like it. Uh, uh, and so we'll eat a meal out or we'll cook together. I, I don't mow the yard unless I feel like it. I'm gonna be honest. Sometimes I enjoy mowing the yard uh, on my Sabbath rest. And so we get outside. If we can be outside, we try to involve our kids, spending time with them or letting them enjoy some of the things that they enjoy. Maybe with extra time, we make it a point to spend time alone with the Lord. We're, we're still trying to figure out how it all works. And sometimes it's hard and other times it goes naturally and goes really well. And I'll tell you, you know you're getting somewhere if when the day is taken from you or swiped from you, it's frustrating. Like you'll know you're growing. Dan Allender has this to say about living and about Sabbath. He says, the Sabbath is an invitation to enter delight. The Sabbath, when experienced as God intended, is the best day of our lives. Without question or thought, it's the best day of the week. It's the day we anticipate on Wednesday, Thursday, or Friday, the day we remember on Sunday, Monday, and Tuesday. Sabbath is the holy time where we feast, play, dance, uh, husbands and wives, have sex, sing, pray, laugh, tell stories, read, walk, and watch creation in its fullness. Don't overthink it. Discover what brings you life and rest. And finally, it's a day to remember. <clears throat> it's a day to remember uh, as the Lord commanded the people of Israel to remember. The idea here is that the Sabbath should include time uh, to think and to reflect and to remember. It's a good time to consider how you're doing in your most important relationships, uh, your parents, your siblings, your, your kids, your spouse. It's a day to evaluate priorities because, again, the heart of the Sabbath isn't just observing one day a week. Like when we're getting Sabbath right, that type of living starts spilling over into every other day, but most importantly, most importantly, Sabbath is a day to remember our relationship with the Lord. Uh, it's a day, it can be a day to get alone and to be quiet, to practice some of the things that we've been talking about all month long, to spend time with the Lord in your Bible, a time to, to sit quietly, a, a time to pray and to talk to God, a time to just remove as many of the distractions as possible. Because here's the thing about our God. He loves spending time with you. Uh, he enjoys watching you do and enjoy the things that you enjoy. And if he created the Sabbath for you and me, like, isn't it only right that we set aside time to be with and to enjoy him? And one of the greatest lessons we can learn, and I'm still learning this, I think we're all still learning this to some degree, and that is that nothing, there, there is nothing that will ever satisfy you in the world like God can and as he can. And he created the Sabbath. He created this opportunity to break from the work, to rest, to play, and to enjoy him for who he really is. I was thinking about some of the holiest places in the world as far as different people groups and their opinions and, and maybe their own faith. Uh, take, for example, the Western Wall, also known as the Wailing Wall in Jerusalem. It's the most religious site for the Jewish people located in the old city of Jerusalem. It's the uh, last remaining outer wall of the ancient Jewish temple and an incredibly important site uh, of modern Israeli history. Uh, and then there's Mecca. Mecca is the birthplace of the prophet Muhammad. The Kaaba is located in the center of the great mosque in Mecca and considered by the Muslims uh, to be the most sacred spot on earth. Thus, Mecca is a deeply spiritual destination for Muslims all over the world and is considered the heart of Islam. 
Uh, there's a place like St. Peter's Basilica. And if you've seen it with your own eyes, you know it's indescribable. Uh, one of the holiest uh, sites in the Catholic tradition. It's traditionally considered to be the burial site of, of St. Peter, uh, the first uh, bishop of Antioch, and later the first bishop of Rome, rendering him the first pope. And then as we know and encounter and the way people think and see all of life today, take a place like Sedona, all right, in Arizona. Uh, it's famous for its so-called vortex sites, spots where the earth's energy is supposedly increased, leading to self-awareness and various kinds of healing. We're all trying to figure life out, right? looking for meaning and significance in all sorts of different things. The interesting thing about following Jesus and the Christian faith is that our God isn't limited to any particular place or particular day. He's available everywhere at all times and to anyone who searches to him to anyone who will put their faith and trust in him. And Jesus made that possible. He made that possible with his death and his life. And because of Jesus, you and I can go directly to God. And it's the Holy Spirit that makes that possible anywhere, anytime, any place. And Sabbath rest, setting aside one day a week is one incredibly important way we encounter him and enjoy him for who he truly is. Let's pray. And Heavenly Father, we do believe and acknowledge that you are the only, you are the one true God who sent your son, Jesus Christ, into this world to make a way. To the one who gave his life, that, that salvation, that forgiveness, that redemption is possible to, to all of us, to anyone who would put their faith and trust in you. And we thank you for that, Lord. We thank you for Jesus, for our Savior, the hope that we have in him, the hope that is available through him to all people uh, for salvation. And certainly as we think about, you know, life beyond this place and certainly for today, but we're reminded today, we've been reminded throughout this whole series, uh, you, like you, you, you offer a better way a better way to do life. Like Jesus is the greatest example of how to do life in this world. And so we thank you that we can come to you in prayer. We thank you that you've provided your word as a source of truth and guidance for us. We, we, we thank you for, man, what you can do in silence and when the distractions are removed. But I also thank you for your grace to continue speaking to us even when life is moving fast and for the gift of Sabbath rest. And so whatever you're doing, Lord, here, uh, whatever you choose to do from this point forward, we just pray you'd have your way in our lives and maybe just raise an awareness, a curiosity for all of us, not just about a day, but about more of Jesus, more of Jesus in each of us. We thank you, Lord. You are so good. And it's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen.